Glenn Van Zutphen on Saturday mornings with Neil Humphreys, only on Money FM 89.3. International News Review. Welcome back to Saturday mornings here on Money FM 89.3. Into our International News Review, Steve Oaken, Senior Advisor, McClarty Associates, joins us. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning, GVZ. Just an exciting morning for two reasons. First, of course, my my good friend and the mentor who I've learned more from uh, about China than anyone is joining us, John, uh, Glenn, I know you're going to introduce him. And second, yep. breaking news, the United States Senate has confirmed Jonathan Eric Kaplan to be the U.S. Oh. ambassador to Singapore, the first we we'll have since, since Ambassador Wagger left the day uh, Trump was inaugurated. So exciting news for U.S.-Singapore relations and excited to hear from John. Oh, fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Steve. And also joining us, John Holden, Senior Director at McClarty Associates China, also the former president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. John, great to have you with us. And the, the big China-U.S. story this week was the Biden-Xi video conference on Monday. Uh, very mixed reviews coming out of that. Uh, welcome, and what's your take on the result of that? Well, good morning, gentlemen, and good morning, Singapore. It's great to be back here. I first came to Singapore in 1973. I've seen a lot of changes <laughs> in this city. Wow. Indeed. It's just Indeed. amazing. <laughs> I, you know, this. it's always good to talk. Uh, you know, uh, Churchill was paraphrased saying, jaw-jaw uh, is better than war-war. And certainly we're not at the brink of war with China, but these conversations between presidents are super, super important. They spoke for three and a half hours, allowing for translation. That's still a lot of conversation. They're trying to put guardrails, this is the U.S. perspective, on the relationship, so there are no, mis no misunderstandings about essential uh, matters. The um, U.S. is committed to, uh, to dividing this relationship into three different buckets. Uh, it's uh, competition is number one, because that's the, that, that's the perception in Washington. Cooperation is another, and if necessary, confrontation. But what we're really doing with the U.S. strategy is to build back better in the U.S., to work with allies, and to balance. Uh, in in Asia, so the balance of power is the essential core element of of um, of strategic uh, thinking, and that's what's that's what's going on, both militarily, economically, and in, in values basis, and va uh, with regards to values. John, just to follow up on that, yeah, we've seen mixed reviews, as as Glenn correctly mm. mentioned, but isn't it better that? They're at least in the room talking. Yes, there's no broad agreement yet on, on climate, on security in the South China Seas, on, on Taiwan and one or two other issues. But the fact that they're meeting, they're in the room together, do you see that as a positive overall or did you expect more substantial agreements made? Hmm. No, I think it's an absolute positive. And I think the, the Biden administration is handling this relationship the way it needs to be done, which is strategically and doing the diplomacy behind closed doors, it doesn't have to be all uh, shouted through megaphones in uh, in the press. So there's stuff that we don't know about this uh, about this meeting, uh, and that's as it should be. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think it's as, this is a very positive thing, and it's clear that uh, that China welcomed this uh, this opportunity as well. So that's um, it's all good in my book. If you're just, uh, just in, yeah, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to uh, uh, talk about one other aspect of it. And this is something that, you know, Minister Chan Chun Singh here said at the Fullerton lecture. He said the winner of the U.S.-China geopolitic, uh, geopolitical uh, rivalry uh, in competition is going to be the country that addresses their issues at home best. The U.S. has so many issues to deal with. China has so many issues to deal with. And I don't know if it was planned or or just convenient that the day of the summit was the day that President Biden signed the legislation putting $1.2 trillion into much-needed U.S. infrastructure. And so the U.S. is getting on track, at least a little bit, in terms of addressing its core domestic challenges when it comes to investment, when it comes to infrastructure. And so this is is equal part of, of the summit is what is each country doing domestically and you know, kudos to the U.S. for the timing. Maybe not intentional, but but certainly. Well, nice. well actually, actually, Steve, it's funny. It was intentional. Uh, Kirk Campbell spoke at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and he said it wasn't um, coincidence that the the meeting took place on the day that was that was signed. Hmm. At least that was. Oh, that's interesting. All right. Yeah. Hey, uh, John, we, we do have to move on to some other topics, but but quickly before we do, uh, the fact that they uh, that she and Biden did not. Uh, 
issue a joint statement after that call. Uh, and they had kind of individual statements. Is there anything that should be read into that? That you know, the joint statement of of affirmation of whatever is always the hallmark of any diplomatic uh, meeting, and and they it was noticeably missing in this. Should we read anything into that? No, I don't think so. This wasn't an uh, an agenda. They didn't have an agenda that addressed a particular issue. So it wasn't a summit about X or Y. It was about everything. And mm -hmm. it's uh, it's pretty hard to get to, on the same page on that. So I, I don't read anything into that at all. Okay, thanks. Let's move on. Uh, U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo was in Asia this past week in Singapore the past couple of days, uh, making stops in Japan, Singapore, Malaysia. Uh, Steve, take us through what you saw uh, during her visit here in Singapore, her meetings with top leaders. Well, I'll, I'll start and then turn it over to John, because John actually met with, with the secretary uh, quite extensively during, during this trip. But what this shows is that the U.S. has a two-prong engagement, uh, or really a three-prong engagement for dealing with China. It's how you deal with China bilaterally. It's how you address your, your, your domestic issues. And it's how you build alliances and how you engage uh, with your uh, partners and allies and friends in the region. And part of this was Secretary Raimondo coming out. We've had multiple cabinet level visits. We've had the vice president here in Singapore. This is part of a continuation that the U.S. is going to be present. The U.S. is going to be engaged. The U.S. is going to start with some type of economic framework. We don't know quite what it will be yet, but that the Indo-Pacific strategy and an ASEAN being central to that Indo-Pacific strategy is, is the core message of her visit. And John has a lot more on the details. Yeah, John, what, what were you hearing from her as far as her, her big key message uh, coming into Singapore and coming into the region? Well, this is a, a, a tested, pragmatic, centrist Democratic politician. She knows how to get things done. And she's, she's a bit handicapped because we've, uh, we've left TPP and CPTPP out, out as being impossible for us at the moment. So she's doing a mix and match kind of an, a, an economic program with, with friends and allies in Asia. And that's, so, so there's, there's a lot of stuff to do. You can talk about supply chains. You can talk about digital and then all the bilateral stuff. So the U.S. is still very present economically in Asia, um, despite this um, our failure to join the CPTPP, which is a problem. John, you alluded to one or two mm -hmm. things there. What what things specifically do you think she'll be discussing in these meetings? I don't think we've um, we've seen the results yet, um, but I expect that there's going to be a lot of follow through. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit too early to say. Uh, I wish, uh, but we'll we'll find out more, and it'll we'll hear it from the capitals in Asia as where, where she's been. Would you expect? But, I, and this question to either of you: Would you either of you expect a, a a great difference in the messaging between Malaysia, Tokyo, and Singapore during her trip, or is it or is it going to be a broad message versus individual country by country? Uh, whoever has a thought on that, <laughs> jump in. <laughs> Well, I mean, here, here's the problem and where the, where the U.S. is so hamstrung right now. Um, the U.S. does not have a, a trade policy to engage with Asia yet. As John mentioned, the United States pulled out of the TPP the moment, literally on day three of, of Trump's presidency. Um, the, the Biden administration said it is not ready to come back to that yet, even though the business community is starting to be very vocal in urging this, such as, such as AmCham Singapore and four other AmChams. Uh, urging the, the Biden administration to come back. So now you're talking about engaging in an economic framework, but not doing it through a trade agreement. How is this going to be possible? Um, and Prime Minister Lee was asked this very explicitly uh, at the Bloomberg conference. And Prime Minister Lee did meet with the, with the secretary. And he said, frankly, I don't know how you're going to have an economic framework without a trade agreement on the back end of it. So hmm. there's a lot of politics that have to be addressed in the United States before we can know the substance of what you're going to do on digital, on semiconductors, hmm. on supply chain, and all those issues that are so critical right now. So where do you think it goes from now, Steve? I mean, you're saying you need an agreement, you need these issues in place. We're still trying to make up ground from the Trump administration. You've got a centrist Democrat doing the rounds, going across Asia this week. Where would you like to see things moving from here? I mean, what you would like to see, well, obviously in an ideal world, is, is, is a member of AmCham Singapore, you'd like to see the U.S. join the, the CPTPP. Um, and if it's not going to do that, you, you need to have the business community continue to put 
the, the, the pressure on as much as it can and to advocate and educate as to why it's so important and why it's to the benefit of workers. So the business community has a lot that it needs to do. But the United States and the Biden administration have to figure out what goes inside this Indo-Pacific framework. It's great that they came out. It's great that they say they have a framework. But now you need to, to put the, you know, put mm. the real uh, legal uh, thrust and, and legal structures behind this framework. Uh, we're on yeah. with Steve Oaken, the senior advisor at McClarty Associates, and John Holden, uh, senior director of McClarty, uh, China, and also the former president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Uh, let's move on to uh, another China-related story. The Marriott in Prague, of all places, uh, has refused to host a a Uyghur conference, uh, this was last month, citing, quote-unquote, political neutrality. Now, the World Uyghur Conference, uh, Congress, rather, is in Germany. It's based there, and they want to bring attention to the plight of Uyghurs in Xinjiang province, a very touchy topic. Uh, John, what do you, uh, as you've read this story, what surfaces for you on, on Marriott's uh, refusal? And then a statement saying they're going to look into it uh, ab about uh, refusing this conference. Well, I think what happened was that the, the, the hotel uh, in Poland made this uh, decision. Um, uh, Czech, I think it was Czech, right? Czech Republic? Was yeah, it was in Prague, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got to, I'm thinking about the, the book I just read, <laughs> From Warsaw Trump with, with Love. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry, John, John Poffert, <laughs> yeah. a, gr a great read, by the way. Uh, no, uh, so, so, so Marriott headquarters has, has come out and said, listen, that's, that's wrong. That's a wrong interpretation of our policies. And this is a, this is a, a land. This is a field of mines for for corporations. Every, mm. China's uh, actions and policies in Xinjiang are things that, that we that companies can't be associated with. So this is this is um, and 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 Marriott has said that we're going to have to train our our, our affiliates um, better about our ESG policies. And on that point, and a slight diversion, but it, it's relevant, you know, the way that corporates and big business are reacting to Chinese policies, either John or Steve, maybe John first. It happened in the same week, of course, that one of Chinese, uh, China's biggest tennis stars allegedly has disappeared. I mean, Peng Shui for coming out and making several allegations, sexual allegations against a member of the Chinese government. There's been a big backlash in Western media and amongst Western organizations. Women's Tennis Association has, has called for an immediate investigation into this alleged disappearance. So I, I seem to see this. How, how do you position this, John, you know, with corporates and media being increasingly vocal of domestic policies within China? Well, it, it does speak to the, the sort of interconnectedness of the world. I mean, you have an, an affair and a domestic affair in domestic affairs of China, and then we know about it, right? She's a, she's a global figure. So, you know, this is, um, this is the world we live in, and it's, com it's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah, Steve, and though, as you're and, seeing and, this, you, yeah, Steve, Steve. Yeah, Steve, I was going to say, and, and it's, it's, it's the companies all over the world have, have to do two things. One, they have to be aware of every issue when it comes to China and when it comes to their home country because not only do you answer to the governments, you answer to your customers and your customers in China are going to have a very different view than your customers in uh, the United States or, or Europe or, or Singapore for that matter. And so, you know, look at what happened to Yakun Kaya Toast, right, the Singapore coffee uh, uh, and toast chain. Um, they put up a promotional video in China that showed Taiwan as one of the countries that they served in their market. And they immediately had to take that website down. They immediately had to close their stores because they were accused by their Chinese customers of promoting Taiwan separatism. And so you have to now be on such a balancing act. And some companies um, have chosen, like LinkedIn, most recently, which we talked about, that they're going to leave China. You have other country, other companies like the NBA and the English Premier League who say we've got to figure out what do we do with our players who have one position and what do we do as a company and, and, and try and balance. And now you've had the WTA said that we're going to support our, our, our 
our player, and we're going to pull out of China at the cost to us of millions and millions of dollars unless we get some resolution um, to her Me Too claims and her inability to publicly speak now. So mm -hmm. it's different for every company, but it just shows you need to have a, a geopolitical and strategic awareness that you never had to have. Uh, yeah. In the case of Marriott and Prague, they issued a statement saying, quote, Marriott International is committed to giving a warm welcome to all. We are in the hospitality business, welcoming people from around the world and from all walks of life, representing, representing many beliefs. The management team at the hotel is contacting the group to apologize as the hotel's response was not consistent with our policies. We are working with the team, uh, the hotel team, to provide additional training and education on our long-standing practices of inclusion. And when we look at the tennis story, uh, apparently the um, Chinese state media published an email on Thursday purportedly from the 35-year-old tennis star saying that she's, quote, resting at home and everything is fine. Um, and she has not been the target of retribution. Yeah, she has not been heard from uh, publicly or seen publicly, I should say, since the 2nd of November. So I just wanted to put those points in there as um, as points of, um, of balance uh, on these stories. John, as we move forward, China has always said, you know, for decades now, uh, you know, interference in their internal affairs is not welcome, whether it is uh, with Hong Kong or Taiwan or Xinjiang or Tibet or anywhere else. Uh, this is not going away. What does the future look like as um, as Western countries and boards are more activist in making sure that they are doing business what th with you know who they perceive is. Um, uh, somebody that that believes in the values that they believe in. I, is there going to be a balancing point or a tipping point at some point from your perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't have the answer. The um, the, the world is evolving in, uh, in in interesting ways. China is is embarking on a on a re reinvigorated attempt to become a a superpower by 2049. Uh, right. They have a plan. They have a, they have a plan in place. And uh, they don't like it to be criticized, and so this is um, they want it to be understood. But uh, if if not, uh, they you know, they'll say never mind. Uh, you don't need to understand us, but you need to follow the way we do things here in China. So this is this is going to be increasingly complicated for for companies. Um, and I I think that there's a lot of communication that needs to happen between industry associations and the Chinese government because there's a misunderstanding of um, how how the two how, how you can welcome international business on the one hand how do you do that uh, and allow them to stay true to their values um, mm. and still operate in China I mean this is this is complicated. It is indeed. So let's change tax slightly, Steve, bring it right up to date. Yourself and John and Mr. Van Zutphen opposite me, you all attended business conferences this week. MICE is back in Singapore. But the question to you, Steve, will it stay back? I mean, I'm reading news that COVID cases are surging across Europe. Europe is now the epicenter for COVID. Uh, Germany is now reintroducing restrictions, despite the VTL with Singapore. So do you see the Singapore mice industry booming now, or do you see events in Europe possibly slowing down the reopening of international conferences? Well, it's going to be fits and starts, but it's, it's you know, it'll be two steps forward, one step back. But we are on a trajectory, and I think the Singapore government recognizes the importance of having these type of events and the value they bring um, and how you try and balance. There was a headline in Reuters uh, that said, Singapore business events bounce back post-COVID, Hong Kong flounders. Right. That is exactly what you want to see if you're the Singapore Tourism Board or you're the Singapore government. Um, yeah. This is really important to this country. I mean, this is a global hub. And, you know, it, look, I, John and I have known each other for 20 years and we were talking, you know, last night at dinner. I, we can't remember the last time we saw each other in person on Zoom all the time in person, maybe right. five years ago. It's right. it's so important. And so I think the Singapore government. Look, is is idiosyncratic and is nonsensical. Some of the rules you have to follow if, if these conferences are, it's still on the right path and it's still going to go forward. Yeah. Briefly, John, you were at the Milken Conference and the Bloomberg Conference this week. What was your conference going experience? 
Well, I was at the Bloomberg conference. It, it was fantastic. And we, we, yeah, we were, we felt welcome. Everybody was, you know, it's, it's hard work. Uh, I have never, I haven't worn a mask so much in my whole life this, this week. Um, but um, it was worth it uh, to be able to see people that re reacquaint uh, yourself with friends, to see Steve uh, without his mask. I mean, this has been fantastic. No, it, it's, <laughs> No, but the pe people people travel from around the world for this uh, for right. in this event, and um, I, I I I just had a blast. I really did. Uh, well, thanks, okay. gentlemen. Thank you both for uh, being with us today, Steve Oaken and John Holden. Appreciate your comments on, on China and on what's happening in the mice uh, situation. Look forward to uh, having you back on uh, sometime in the future. And John, safe travels. Hey.